The Rebel Capitalist Show. Generally, it's a relationship between the Fed and the commercial banking system as far as broad money. But now all of a sudden we've, we've inserted the government because the Fed is monetizing so much of the government debt. And if the Fed monetizes the debt, then once the government spends the money into the real economy via the TGA, now all of a sudden you're, you're increasing uh, broad money when if the government would tax it, then spend it, they're kind of recirculating those dollars, if you want to think about it that way. That's so it, true. It, it isn't necessarily increasing broad money. So it's a completely different uh, dynamic. You know, one thing I'd love to get your opinion on, I, I listened to a, a fantastic interview the other day on Macro Voices with my good buddy Eric Townsend and, and Russell Napier, where he was talking about his, uh, you know, he has uh, he's kind of an inflationist now, and he sees that coming down the the road in the future. And he was saying how what he kind of he's trying to use some game theory here. And what he sees potentially happening is the way the government is going to not only uh, control the yield curve through yield curve control, but they're also going to try to control inflation is by taking a lot of the money creation away from the commercial banking system. And therefore, he, he sees kind of this environment, if I was understanding him correctly, he sees this environment where the government is spending money into existence, like, like MMT, basically. And they're, but they're taking control away of some of the money creation or all of the money creation from the commercial banking system. Therefore, th it, that's not a variable anymore. And the right. central planners think that they can maybe fine tune it a little bit better. And then he also sees potentially price controls and a, a lot more micromanagement. But what do you think about that concept of maybe some of the uh, money creation being more direct from the government into the real economy as opposed to uh, from the Fed through the commercial banking system into the real economy? Look, I, I'm not against that view. The thing with me and what I've been trying to figure out for the last 10, 20 years is the sequence of events. Right. And, and so they're going to end up probably having to resort to that option, but that's like a later stage option. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and quite frankly, look, look, the CARES Act and what we've what we're seeing now with fiscal, you know, one-off, you know, government transfers, that's kind of akin to the MMT uh, concept that's out there, right? And so we're seeing a version of that, but it's but we're being told that it's temporary, it's not permanent, right? And so because the, when you do this for one year, then the following year you're going to have a, a cliff. You always have this kind of fiscal cliff. And so then you can't really, your expectations don't change enough to say, oh, I'm going to have a permanent stream of this new you know, money or whatever you want to call it. And then that I'm concerned that everyone else has this stream and they're going to start bidding up everything. And, and then, you know, your food prices go up. Every, you know, what, we're, what we're seeing now is like an early glimpse of that sort of world. But I think that they're trying to avoid jumping to that stage and that's why they're still using the traditional mechanisms and they're going to rely on the Fed to, to, to do a, a lot of heavy lifting. And they're going to do this fiscal. We'll see what kind of fiscal um, stimulus we get. Uh, I mean, they probably and do. You mean, when we talk about heavy lifting, just to be clear, that means that the Fed is buying those treasuries pretty much directly from the Treasury auction through the primary dealer banks and kind of that shell game they have. But they're basically monetizing the debt. I mean, look, they're monetizing the debt through the secondary uh, markets in that in that regard. But. And but they're still not buying one for one, right? Like last year, they were buying more than what was being issued. Right. And now, like, given what the sort of debt load that's coming, by the middle of the year, the Fed should be behind the curve, and there's going to be more treasuries that the public sector has to, you know, the private sector, you want to call it, not the public sector, but actual, you know, individuals and, and corporations and, and investors have to start to buy those treasuries mm. by the middle of the year. If at that point the Fed says we're not just buying eighty uh, billion a month, we're going to have to buy one hundred twenty or one hundred sixty, whatever the number is, to make the math work out, then we know that fiscal dominance has been permanently established. It's not just a temporary. We're getting through this difficult period of the pandemic, right? Okay. If they up the ante in the middle of the year and the economy is like doing well, like, you're going to be like, what? That doesn't make any sense. Let let just like market forces take over. And at some point, you know, the stimulus has to end from the government and then things will clear in 2022. If they change that mid midstream this year, then I'm wrong. And then, yeah, there's no real technical limit because then the fiscal authorities can then be the way that the money gets into the real economy. Right. 
So but I, I just it, feel like there's a step in between. Like I think like yeah. they'll try it, and then if it fails, then they go to the the more nuclear option. Yeah. So do you think the yield curve is steepening right now because of inflation expectations, or because the market is front running this um, this event in the middle of 2021? where the, the government is going to be issuing more treasuries than the Fed is buying. Therefore, the private sector is going to have to soak up some of those treasuries. We'll see what the demand is. If the demand's not there, then rates go up. So yeah. what, what do you think there? Do you think the, the yield curve is front running that or uh, is we're really seeing future inflation expectations? I think we'll see a combination of two. Um, the five-year, five-year, I mean, maybe you know it. It's just like the forward five-year inflation expectation, like, like okay. people think in five years' time. And then the five-year, um, which is the blue one, is the current five-year inflation that you expect to get for the next five years. And, and you can see it's a pretty sharp move. I mean, it, it basically, from March of last year, it's gone up over 200 basis points, which over 2%, basically, right? Mm. So a lot of like of this is priced in. Now, the the, the the challenge or the argument for the for the opposite view is that in 2008, we didn't have this sort of uh, government slash Fed co cooperation, right? So we don't know how high inflation expectations may get, but they've moved a ton a lot. So, and the reason why I show this chart relative to the forward one, it's a little wonky. So I'm just explaining this, the, the, the little graph in the bottom is the spread between those two bl uh, blue and orange line. Oh, the gray is the spread between the two, between orange and uh, blue. Yeah. yeah. And Got it's it. pretty it. extreme. I mean, like you need to start to price the reason like the five year five year forward is 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 for the gold people. If the gold people are right and if we're going to get permanently higher inflation, mm -hmm. then the whole long term interest rates have to move faster than short term interest rates. You know what I mean? Like so like right now, everyone's like, oh, yeah, for the next five years, maybe two or three of those five years, we're going to get a lot of inflation. But then it's going to peter off because the government can't keep this going forever. Mm. That's what that spread is telling you. Like it's like the first five years of a 10 year window is going to be higher inflation. We'll see. It's debatable, but that's the that's the pricing right now. OK. And the orange. OK, so now that you know that, then at least we can I can explain it quickly and not have to. All right, cool. I'll start from. Um, yeah. So, so, George, to your point about you know what is the curve really embedding or trying to expect? Yeah, I, I think it's yeah, it's definitely a combination of more supply coming. We could discuss that later, but the inflation piece of it is playing a big role. And it's, and it, as we mentioned at the beginning of, of our conversation, the inflation uh, move higher initially was because they got so cheap, these tips and, and inflation expectations and hedges were so cheap during March, April, May, and June, that all this Fed liquidity and all the Fed buying of these tips as well helped lift them off the floor. And as you can see from this chart, the blue line, if you go into like you know February 20 or March 20 of, of last year, yep. got close to almost zero. Like basically, the market was expecting like no inflation for, yep. for the next five years, yep. and it's and it's jumped over 200 basis points, so roughly two percent more of inflation in a matter of the last year. That's a pretty fast move for the tips mm -hmm. market, and then I compare it against this orange line, which is the inflation in five years time for the next five years so five years we call it the five year five year which is almost like a 10 year interest rate that inflation expectation is not running as fast as the current inflation which is telling you that the market thinks okay fine fiscal authorities fed can maybe generate inflation in the short run but it's not sustainable and so this is why if we can see this spread start to close a little bit and actually all inflation expectations start moving towards you know two and a half or three percent right now it's around 2.4 um then the gold gold people those that are worried about currency debasement whatever sort of concerns about what inflation does to your hard-earned money then they have a legitimate case because then, then the actual bond market which is one of the biggest markets out there is equally concerned that this is not just a temporary fluke it's a permanent inflationary shift in regime then that changes the equation for everything. Right. So you probably already explained this, but I, I'm seeing that the the gray line is now down at basically zero. And it looks like the blue line has crossed 
the orange line, which seems rare. It seems like generally this blue line is, is underneath the orange line. So what is that telling us? Is that telling us um, just kind of what you just went over? Or is that something different? No, that's exactly what it's telling you. It's, it's basically saying that uh, people are more concerned about short-term inflation for the next couple of years. In, oh, okay, got it. And, and that's the, what the five-year blue one is capturing. It's the what we call the spot rate. Uh, and then the forward rate is the five-year five year forward break-even inflation expectations. That's the orange line. It's not going up as fast because the market's saying, okay, maybe the first five years you get inflation, but for the latter half of those five years or the 10-year window, yeah. the second five are going to be lower because – there's still deflationary forces out there in the economy. Huh. Well, that's interesting. When you when you take that back to 2005, 2006, I'm just saying the exact same thing. And I don't know if this, this forecast the GFC, but right. was they forecasted or not, it, they got that right. <laughs> that's for yeah, sure. no, it's, oh, yeah, 100%. I mean, the, the bond market, I mean, is at least, well, now everything moves so much faster because of information. People have gotten smarter. People are listening to your videos. Um, and they're, and they're, and they're starting to understand these, you know, these relationships, right? Yeah. And you can start to get a better grasp of it, but you know, 10, 15 years ago, the bond market was like, well, you know, the housing market is, it's not sustainable. And at some yeah. point it's going to cause a deflationary downdraft. And it did. Yeah, so and, and so that's what it was telling us back in 2005, 2006. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating to go back and, and think that through with the benefit of, uh, hindsight. All right. Awesome. So what's the next chart we should go to? Yeah, well, maybe just move to the next one. Another orange line and another blue line. Yeah, okay. Got now, it. Speed of the um, five-year index, inflation. Yeah. yeah. So this is looking at the speed of the inflation. So basically, it's a zoomed-in version of the chart we just went through. Okay. Just to make the point that this move um, is much faster than what was coming out of the financial crisis. So coming out of the financial crisis, which is the blue line of 2008-2010, Inflation expectations also had a big impulse higher, mm -hmm. got above 2%, but much later than when what we just did. So All we right. went from the COVID lows last year in, in March of 2020 to the most recent print uh, as of today, uh, on the, uh, or February 12th, I should say. That is a big, fast move. And I'm a big believer in, in bond markets in general, for those that are listening or involved, bond markets are much more mean reverting than any other asset class. There's a there's a it it stretches too far and then it kind of finds a a resting place. Right. I I think this is my own personal view that in the next three or six weeks, given what has been happening in other asset classes, mm -hmm. that we'll probably do a retracement. I could be wrong, and we keep powering through to higher rates and more inflation because it's becoming such a big topic. But I do think that like you know risk markets are stretched. There's so much euphoria in the system right now. It won't take much to see like a 5-10% correction in the equity market, and the bond market will still receive some of those flows.